I think we now are going to move on to our next speaker, who was the first speaker on the programme, um, who is Professor uh, Graham Watt, um, Emeritus Professor in General Praxis and Primary Care at the University of Glasgow and Coordinator of the Deep End Project in Scotland from 2009 to 2016 editor of the Deep End um, International Bulletin and also a long time friend and colleague um, of Julian Tudor Hart, starting with a medical student attachment in 1975. So we're going to pan out a little bit um, um, into the kind of origins of the, of the Deep End project. And Graham is going to take us on a journey through the history and the philosophical background of the Deep End project in Scotland, inspired by the work of Julian Tudor Hart. Thank you very much, Graham. Okay, can you hear me, Kerry? Yes. Good. Gosh, what a relief. And I remember when we first had a black and white television in the late 1950s, there was a, a, a serial called the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. And one episode had a policeman carrying out an appendicectomy by phone instructions from the centre. And of course, the phone went dead as he was doing it. And I feel somewhat like that trying to give this talk. But let's see how we get on and jump jump in if there's a, a problem with any of the connections. Uh, I'll be getting the slides moved by uh, Mark and uh, at the RCPE. So here's slide number one. Um, Tudor Hart was born in London and lived most of his life in Wales, but was his grandparents were a quarter Canadian, a quarter Polish and 50% Scottish. His maternal grandmother, Annie McNichol from Helensborough and her husband, Norman Macbeth, an engineer from Glasgow. So he's not that far away. Next. Next slide. It's, it's about 50 years since publication of his paper on the inverse care law, and it's not an anniversary he would have been keen to celebrate. It was an early publication, his fifth, with over 150 and several books to come, many of which he deemed more important. And the big idea that fueled his life's work was that a general practitioner working on a defined front of the war against misery and disease could improve the health of a local population. And further, he believed that by working together and with their communities, primary care teams in the NHS could sow the seeds of a better society. Next slide. The title inverse care law was catchy and it drew on Isaac Newton's inverse square law. But while Newton's law had precise and predictable properties, the gravitational pull between two objects varying inversely with the square of the distance between them, the inverse care law was a loose amalgam of several things, none with mathematical properties. Next, Julian was very clear that while medical services were not the main determinant of mortality or morbidity, that was no excuse for the failure to match the greatest need with the highest standards of care. Next. In 1971, with the NHS barely 20 years old, he was concerned about the re-entry of the market into UK healthcare. As night follows day, that's a prescription for inequity and inequality. Asked for how long the NHS would last, and Iron Bevan replied, for as long as people are prepared to fight for it, implying not one single effort, such as the battle over the 1948 Act, but a sustained campaign of defence, like maintaining, more like, more like campaigning, more like maintaining a Dutch dike, keeping the tides of market interest at bay. And looking south as NHS England steadily seems to be succumbing to market encroachments and privatisation by stealth, would-be defenders of the NHS are being tested as never before. Next. There was another important theme. Notwithstanding universal access free at the point of use for which the NHS is famous, if the distribution of healthcare resources is not commensurate with need, inequity and inequality will result. So some groups get the benefits of effective needs-based care, whilst others don't. Julian argued that this wasn't just about resource distribution. It was also about the preferences of the medical profession. 
as indicated by the content of medical education, the undervaluing, indeed, disparagement of general practice, and the career and geographical choices of doctors. The challenge were, challenges were cultural as well as political. Next. Next, yeah. Julian was unusual as a commentator on health inequalities in that unlike most writers on the subject who have little or no connection with policy or practice, he could do something about it in his own community. He worked with the MRC Epidemiology Unit in South Wales, whose community studies had demonstrated the usually asymptomatic nature of very high blood pressure. The VA trial of blood pressure lowering had shown that strokes could be prevented. Echoing Breck's dictum, the figures compel us, Julian became the first doctor in the world to measure the blood pressure of all his patients. It was the beginning of 25 years of looking after a whole population, pioneering information systems that measured what he hadn't done, the measurement of omission, so he could identify and address the rule of halves, working with patients initially face to face, shifting slowly to side by side, employing and empowering his practice team, living and working in the community, staying long enough to make a difference, the difference being the premature mortality was eventually 30% lower than, than in a similar neighbouring village. He put his big idea into effect, reversing the inverse care law in one of the most deprived communities in South Wales. This story is one of the foundation stones of general practice and mustn't be forgotten. Next. The killer slide. Fast forward 20 years, this slide divides the Scottish population into tenths of just about half a million in each group, most affluent on the left, most deprived on the right. Premature mortality in blue and multimorbidity in red increase over two and a half fold across the spectrum, but funding in black is broadly flat, especially in the more deprived half of the population. 20 years ago, it was possible to measure GP manpower in whole time equivalents, but the 2003 GP contract removed that information. Uh, amazingly, total GP funding per patient as shown in this slide is a pragmatic alternative, albeit imperfect measure of GP resource, because of course, not all of it is spent on patient care. Consultation rates in the bottom and green rise a little, about 20%, but with no extra resource, this is only achieved in deprived areas in the bottom right-hand corner by having shorter consultations or working a longer day. Next. Stuart Mercer showed that GP consultations in that right-hand corner were shorter dealt with more multimorbidity and social complexity, had lower expectations and poorer outcomes, especially for patients with mental health problems, and were associated with higher GP stress. The reality of the inverse care law as experienced by doctors and patients. Next. Turn the slide upside down and you see where we got the idea of a swimming pool and the deep end logo. Next with the deep end of a pool, the steep slope of need, the flat line of resource, a sunrise or a sunset, depending on your disposition. Top left, a thistle for Scotland. Down the right, left hand side, a spertle, that's a traditional stirring instrument. The whole thing, a flag for rallying under. Next. And now there are similar flags for deep end projects in Ireland, Australia, and six English areas, plus possible projects starting in Canada, Denmark, the US, and Belgium. Next. There's been four deep end international bulletins, each with 40 pages of news and views from the various deep end projects. The fifth will be ready shortly. The projects have given identity, voice, shared activity, shared learning, and policy impact to a previously neglected group of general practitioners and by proxy to the patients and communities they serve. Next. 
what can G DPEN GPs do and what can be done to help them? The first step was to listen to what they had to say. At a conference in 2009 involving GPs from practices serving the 100 most deprived communities in Scotland, that's about 10% of all practices. Two thirds of practices were represented. It was the first time they'd ever been convened or consulted. The seating plan was a circle with everyone in the front row. The conference report captured their experience and views. Next and set the agenda for a series of roundtable discussions on specific topics, all with short and long reports on the DPEN website, the latest addressing general practice in the time of COVID. Next. Some reports have been about austerity, welfare benefits, alcohol pricing, drawing on the experience of practitioners to highlight social issues as they affect patients. Next. But deep end advocacy has mainly been about healthcare. If healthcare is not at its best where it's needed most, inequalities in health will widen. As healthcare has become more effective, the implications of inequity have become more important. Next. All this gave rise to the deep end manifesto. More time for consultations addressing the inverse care law better use of serial encounters, building local health systems with general practice as the natural hub, better sharing of experience and learning, better support from the centre, stronger leadership at every level, especially ground level. Nothing very startling there. The last point on leadership emphasised by Tudor Hart, who commented, everything depends on leaders at practice level demanding media attention, gaining public support, and insisting on material resourcing from governments in return for which they can guarantee immensely greater efficiency of care generated by people who know each other. He knew that to achieve change, new alliances would be needed with politicians and the public to put pressure on the establishment. Next. Of course, not every GP signs up to this. My colleague, Rhiannon Babel, now back in the States, interviewed GPs working in deprived areas of Glasgow. All saw their role in clinical consultations. Some saw no further than that, while others tuned in to patients' social situations, viewed the local community as a resource, saw the social and political determinants of poor health being played out in front of them and wanted to do something about it. Next. Engagement and listening were the first steps, but only a start. Keeping the initiative going required coordination, documentation, continuity, provided in the Scottish project by colleagues in an academic department. With a network of interested practices, we were also ready to take on projects when opportunities arose to show what could be done, because advocacy isn't only what you say, and in inequalities in health, there is a huge volume of things that people say. It's also what you do. Next. Over 10 years, the Scottish Project has developed worked examples of extended consultations for selected patients, GP protected time, attached or embedded co-workers, including link practitioners, social care workers, financial advisors, and alcohol nurses, enhanced multidisciplinary teams, a pioneer scheme for young GPs. To date, only link workers and financial advisors are being rolled out to all deep end practices. In both cases, after almost 10 years of pioneering work, we've learned that advocacy isn't a short sprint, but a marathon requiring persistence and perseverance and not being deterred when the establishment, by which I mean the existing order of power and resource, says no, as it often has. There is a lot of unfinished business. Next. In 2019, we had a conference in Glasgow to celebrate the life and work of Julian Tudor Hart, the progress of the Deep End projects, and the publication of a book, The Exceptional Potential of General Practice, with 55 contributions from 11 countries, 44 of them general practitioners, 
to 50 percent from Scotland. I think there's no other book like that with such a Scottish input. Next, the idea of the book was that medical students and young and not so young doctors would say, yes, that's what I do. That's what I want to be part of. That's what my career needs to be about. Next. The primary motivation of most deep end GPs isn't to address the abstraction of inequalities in health, but rather to improve patient care, closing the gap between what they're able to do and what they could do with more time and resource. And this is partly about evidence, but it's also about values. I shadowed a GP in Scotland's most deprived general practice, Petra Sambali, observing her day from seven in the morning to seven in the evening. And I wrote it up in the BJGP. I saw multimorbidity in large measure, and I don't mean the simple counting of conditions, but rather the number, severity, complexity, and continuing nature of health and social problems in families and households. A succession of complicated stories. I saw the importance of prior knowledge, allowing consultations to start at a higher level and without which much less could be achieved in a short consultation. I saw the importance of empathy and the trust patients placed in a doctor who knew them well and cared what happened to them. I saw no worried well patients, but I saw a worried doctor using her better knowledge to anticipate and try to prevent complications. She was ambitious for what might be achieved, not immediately, but over time. Every patient matters. Next. In Tales of the Thousand and One Nights, Shahrazada had to invent a new story every day. Her life depended on it. And that's also the task of primary care, helping to create strong patient stories. Every practice is a compendium of stories, but what kind of stories? Who knows? It's a black box. Next. An important part of story building is boosting patients' knowledge, confidence, and agency to take charge. Next, without which self-care and self-help, self-management are destinations, not starting points. It's a shared journey. In Julian Tudor Hart's words, initially face to face, shifting slowly to side by side. Next, not every patient needs that, but in Scotland, the 10% of patients with four or more conditions who account for a half of potentially preventable unplanned hospital admissions certainly do. Next. Patients with multimorbidity are all different. There's no simple case definition, but their needs are the same. Unconditional, personalized, continuity of care from a small team of providers whom they know and trust. Relationships are the silver bullets of general practice and primary care, and not just relationships with patients. Next. The intrinsic strengths of general practice or family medicine are first contact, population coverage, continuity, coordination, flexibility, long-term relationships and trust. Features that aren't exclusive to general practice, but very few public services have them in such large degree. And that makes general practice the natural hub of local health systems. Next. Of course, hubs go nowhere unless connected via spokes to other services and community resources. And each spoke is a relationship that needs to be built up and looked after. Next. It follows that realizing the exceptional potential of individual general practices requires competence, not only in clinical consultations, but also in two building programs, neither based on bricks and mortar or fancy architecture, but on relationships. The first building a compendium of patient narratives over time. The second building strong local health systems based on general practice hubs. Next. In this respect, the independence of individual general practices is both an asset, 
providing huge scope for local initiative, enterprise, leadership, but also a liability as a prescription for variation, inefficiency, inequity, and a weak collective voice. The exceptional potential of general practice, its contribution as a coherent system depends therefore on three types of accountability, upwards to funders providing quality and value, downwards to patients and local communities addressing their needs, and sideways to other practices ironing out inefficiency and inequity. Next. So a third building program is required strengthening the capacity and collegiality and solidarity of practices via a range of supporting and connecting infrastructure next, including resources commensurate with needs, information systems to measure omission and monitor progress, the, you know, the balance between routine and emergency care, the quality of patient experience or stories, the amount of social capital in local health systems, etc. Educational opportunities to share experience and learning, research and evaluation to show what works, career opportunities to attract and retain committed practitioners. Next. Of course, the building programmes I have described are needed everywhere, pro rata based on need, but the NHS is not at its best where it's needed most. Most inequalities in health will widen. There's four cogent reasons for beginning at the bottom of the slope. Healthcare is not built on a level playing field, it's built on a slope. First, by improving outcomes for individuals and delivering such care for everyone, population health can be improved and inequalities in health narrowed, reversing the inverse care law. Addressing health inequalities is a consequence of such care rather than its starting point. Next. Second, for health service managers, stronger care in the community can prevent, postpone, or lessen crises requiring emergency A&E attendance or hospital admission. Patients can pass through the gateway to emergency services at any time they wish, but when they have access to a primary care team they know and trust, when they're confident in their care arrangements, and when the complications of their conditions have been prevented, they choose not to. The elegance and sophistication of this type of gatekeeping is that there is no gate. Next. Third, for an increasing group of deep end practitioners, this is what they aspire to do. It's the direction they want their careers to take. It's the collegiate culture they want to be part of. Here's the Scottish deep end steering group meeting recently. Lots of young GPs, mostly women. They are the future. They are the beating heart of the project. Next. Finally, and perhaps most important, it's what publicly funded doctors can contribute to the healing of society. The late John Berger, who many know as the author of a book about general practice, The Fortunate Man, also wrote when reviewing the work of the artist Frida Kahlo, in the dark age in which we are living in the new world order, I don't need to tell you what that is, the sharing of pain is one of the essential preconditions for a refinding of dignity and hope. Much pain is unshareable, but the will to share pain is shareable. And from that inevitably inadequate sharing, comes a resistance. Next. Healthcare can be part of that resistance by excluding exclusions, keeping everyone on board, building three types of relationship. Inclusive healthcare can be a civilizing force in an increasingly dangerous, fragmented and uncertain world. Thank you.